chapter 4, The Nature of God, focusing right now on God's attributes of greatness. So we've already talked at some length about who God is, what he's like. But the reality is, as you start having discussions with people, this becomes a central issue. Most people around the world have some concept of God, or at least some concept of the divine being. The question and the sticking point for them becomes who is he? What is he like? And in fact, when I say that most people have a concept of God, that's about it, just a very shadowy concept, kind of a general notion of some greater divine being out there who's always on my side, generally who's available when I need him, whatever that means, who's available for disasters and things like that. And so then I just make sure I do enough to keep him happy with me and otherwise live out my life. Scripture, however, reveals very specific things about our God. Who is he? What is he like? That's not up for someone's personal evaluation. It's just a reality. The common topic that comes up or the top common direction the conversation goes as people discuss or as you try to talk with people about who God is and what he like, what he is like, the common response is, well, I could never believe in a God who is such and such, or I believe in God or the way I view God is such and such. And the, the core foundation that scripture comes to us with, God is not a construct that we build up. What is a God that I would like to be true? That's not the way this works. God is a fact. He is real. God exists. And God tells us what he is like. And we respond or must respond to that. Now, starting with the attributes of greatness, I just want to give you an overview quickly. I'm going to show you the attributes. I'm going to show you the definitions that we'll be using. And then we'll work through these attributes each in turn. Of course, these Definitions are always available for you as well in the, the notes that we use. But these are the core attributes that we will be talking about under attributes of greatness. The personal nature of God, that he is holy, sovereign, omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, self-sufficient, immutable, or unchanging, and that God is spirit. Start with the first. God is personal. He thinks, speaks, and acts. God is personal. Now, what do we mean by that for just for starting out? And here's a core foundation for that. If you want to compare our thinking or our conception of God to, let's say, Buddhism or kind of a philosophical deism, in both of those cases, what you have is a, a God who exists at a distance, who does not interact with us, or in the case of Buddhism, a kind of a, a God who is more of a concept than an actual personal God. And what we mean by a personal God is that our God interacts with us. God thinks, God speaks, God acts. He does things in the world. And you can see this from the very beginning of the story. I mean, start out in Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. What you've got is a God who acts. You, you get into just chapter one and God speaks, let there be light. You get just a little bit further into the, the, the narrative of the creation, the creation narrative, and God begins then to, you hear, interaction or thought. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And there's purposing and planning. And it's very clear then to move to an additional degree that God is relational. Because now he walks with Adam and Eve in the garden. There's fellowship. There's interaction. And if you put these, these pieces together, what you're recognizing is that God is not merely just an external force, kind of like electricity or logic or... Uh, love, but that God is a personal God, a God who thinks, speaks, acts, and interacts or has relationship. That has massive implications for us, of course, doesn't it? 
It means that we interact with God in similar ways so that we can interact with him personally. We pray to him. We speak to him. We hear his words. He speaks to us. It is possible to love him. It is possible to trust him, to believe that he can intervene and he does intervene in the world, to believe that he sees, he knows, he understands, even that he empathizes. He looks at my condition and he understands what it feels like to be in that condition. And based on that having compassion, he steps in and interacts or acts in the world in real ways to change realities. See, all of these things we just take for granted. You start processing what's going on and you realize underneath all of this, there is an underlying assumption we're just making that God is or that God must be a personal God. Two other implications that I'd like to draw out here before we move on from this point. The first is this, one implication of the fact that God is a personal God is what I just said. We interact with him. We pray to him. We love him. We trust him. We hear from him. He understands our position. But the, the deepest implication I'd like to draw out here is that sin is not just sin or an act against some kind of impersonal reality. It's not as though I just broke the laws of logic. It's not as though I just did damage to the unity of the universe, but that just sort of exists out there as a concept. It is a sin against a personal being. Do not think of ethics or right and wrong or the fabric of morals somehow as a kind of framework that exists around God, as though those things are just absolute, those things are there before he was there. And then God is inside of those and he obeys the rules and we also are supposed to obey the rules. Don't think of ethics as a thing separate from God. Morals, right and wrong, ethics, those are functions of his nature. He is holy, he is righteous, he is good. And that itself tells us what it means to be good and righteous and holy. And on that basis then, when I sin, what I'm actually doing is betraying a personal God. I'm actually turning around in all of the goodness and the grace he's shown me. I'm turning my back. It's a personal betrayal. It is a personal offense. It's an insult. It's spitting in the face of the one who made me, loves me, and has cared for me, saved me. And that then gives us a very strong understanding of sin. Sin now is a very weighty thing because it's a personal insult. And the other implication I would like to draw here, or other point I need to make before we move away from this, is to recognize that God's relational nature, that God is personal, is not just an expression of his nature after creation. Okay, this is critical. To realize that it is not as though before creation, God was impersonal, just a static force, a, a being kind of cut off or removed from all of these realities we've talked about here. Before there was us and before there was a world, God was already relational. How is that possible? The Trinity. What you see in creation before there is humanity is God speaking, let us make man in our image. He's not speaking to the angels. He can't be speaking to any other part of creation. What's he doing? It is God speaking to himself. And as, of course, you progress across the rest of Scripture and you understand in its completion the doctrine of the Trinity, you come to appreciate the fullness of this. God was not lonely before there was a world. God did not create the world so that he could have someone to talk to. God already enjoyed perfect fellowship from eternity past. Or another way of saying this, God has always been personal. God has always been relational. Before there was a world, before there was, a, there was humanity, before there was anything, there was God. And he was already personal and relational. 
One other point, though, that I want to that I need to discuss underneath this question of God's being personal is emotions. And so, a basic question I can ask here is: Is God emotional? I just give that question to you. Is God emotional? What would it mean? How would we discuss that? And we should recognize a couple of things. Number one, Scripture speaks regularly of God with responses, emotional responses. Okay, so we won't go through passages to support this because it's just all over Scripture. But the idea that God is capable of love, pity, mercy, compassion, okay, those are all emotions. I said early, earlier, empathizing, looking at my situation and understanding that. Even emotions like anger. God can be jealous. God can be grieved. God can rejoice. God can even, and this is where we have to be careful, regretful or sorrowful. God can look at a situation and because of people's action, feel pain or look at the situation and be concerned, grieving about what has happened. Well, what's going on here? What is this? And the fact that God compares these realities, what I just, the, the words I just used, that he compares them in some way to our own emotions means that there is some kind of similarity. There's some kind of analogy between them. All right? when, when God says, I love you, we know what that means because we also experience love. In fact, it, it actually works the opposite direction. It is not as though we have love, and so therefore, now from that, God experiences love, obviously. God experienced love before there was us. What we're actually talking about is him inserting or embedding in us the image of God. And because his image or his nature or some analogy of what he is, is embedded in us, when we then experience love, he says, right, that's something that comes from me. And that helps us on a lot of different levels. That helps us better understand our own emotions. Okay, one of the concepts I'd love for us to get from this is that emotions are not wrong or something to be pushed away. There's kind of a stoic assumption we sometimes make that Christian stability means I push all my emotions down and I don't feel things strongly. Quite the contrary. God expresses strong emotions. Having a, a strong, strong emotions or strong emotional responses, it's not necessarily an expression of fallenness. It's, it's actually an analogy, an analog to God's own nature. And yet this is where it starts to get complicated, doesn't it? It is not impossible for me to experience anger in a way that is sanctified. That's not impossible. It just doesn't happen very often. And that's because we see in our emotions both the image of God, positive, and our own fallenness. And both of those are there. Both the image of God and our fallenness, both at the same time. Now, a couple of things then that make God's emotions unique or distinct, things that are absolutely distinct from our own. Number one, God's responses do not distort or reach extremes. God's responses are always appropriate to the situation. I mentioned anger just a moment ago. Part of the problem that we have as humans is that when we're angry, that anger explodes. It expands. If, if the proper response to the situation was here, we tend to overshoot. God's responses are not like that. And secondly, related, God's emotional responses do not color his responses to other people. In other words, if, if, you, if I am angered about a situation here, maybe even we might say righteous anger, you know, justly angry and frustrated at this situation, someone walks up to me and asks me an innocent question, I might respond, wah! And it's because the strong emotion from here has been carried across to here. If you recognize the reality that God is working and answering prayers and hearing the responses of billions of people across the world, then you recognize that in that process, he is both judging, forgiving, saving, showing compassion, and all of that simultaneously. So does God have emotions? Absolutely. God is personal. That was our first attribute or the first point we'll make about the nature of God. But in a way that is both similar and extraordinarily different from the way that human beings express emotions.
The second attribute I need to talk about is God's holiness. And I'm going to define it this way. God is utterly free from any vestige of sin, and he is absolutely unique. Okay, now, if you hear that definition already, I've given you kind of two parts in it, haven't I? He is utterly free from any vestige of sin, and he is unique. Let me start out by just saying that this is one of the most heavily emphasized attributes. As you read across scripture, you find holiness being discussed constantly. Uh, about 665 times across scripture, you have this word or the words, the word family around holiness. But it's far more than that, really. What you've got beyond just the word holiness are ideas or expressions or phrases that talk about God as unique. God as distinct, that God is unlike anything else. And let me build that out first. The first aspect of holiness, he is absolutely and utterly unique. Nothing is like him. What I have up on the screen is a diagram for all that exists. Okay, and it's obvious why it's everything, because I only have two categories of things up here, God and everything else. Now, in terms of that, what I'm going to just do, and we'll come back to this concept later, is to recognize there is a fundamental divide across and between those things. Another way of saying this is, if you ask me what are the categories of reality, I only have these two categories. It is exactly and entirely true. There are only two kinds of things in the world. The only two things that exist are God and everything else. Another way of describing this, if I wanted to build out this idea a little bit further, is that we can recognize within these two categories, God is unique because he is creator. Everything else is created. Meaning the part of the, the core distinction between these two is that I can attach all other, all kinds of other concepts to the top category. Only God is eternal. Now, other things are everlasting. My soul will never cease to exist. So forever and ever there will be me. But I was not there forever and ever in the past. By definition, only God can be omnipresent. Only God can be omniscient. Only God can be truly immutable. So you've got concepts like this that are unique and specific only to him. And one way of summarizing that reality, all of those things, is the concept we're talking about right now. God alone is holy. God alone has perfect and complete essential holiness. Now, let me talk then a little bit more about that idea. What do we mean by essential holiness? What is that concept? I've already alluded to the fact that there are two concepts, actually, underneath this idea of holiness. And that's because what we often think of as holy, we think of that word or that concept, is the ethical holiness. I'll come to that in a moment. But the sense of holiness as opposed to sin. The opposite of holy is sinful. What I'm talking about here, the opposite of holy is common, or let's say it even better, the opposite of holy is everything else. And here, just to build that idea out a little more, let's look at some scriptures that do this. So here are just three passages out of many, many passages we could, could, we could consider. Psalm 89, verse 8, O Lord, God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like unto thee? I mean, the basic question we're asking is, who is like God? or even to your faithfulness round about you. Isaiah 40, 18, 40 verse 18, to whom then will you liken God? What likeness will you compare to him? There's not even a close comparison to the nature and glory of God. Remember the former things of old, he says, for I am God, there is none else, I am God, and there is none like me. I mean, this is the sheer essence of the concept of essential holiness. There is no one like God. He is absolutely, utterly, entirely unique. Now, let me just pause for a second with one idea. I gave you the chart a little bit ago, and I talked about God and everything else, and I drew, drew a line straight across. Okay, another word for this is to emphasize God's transcendence. Transcendence is the idea that God is higher 
distant, greater, more majestic. He is unique and distinct from everything else. Transcendence is slightly different from holiness, but very, very similar in terms of concept. One thing I would like you to know about this is transcendence is paired with eminence. And so those are words that I want you to know. Transcendence, God is distinct from everything. Eminence means that he is close to us, meaning he relates to us. And in fact, the two attributes we've already talked about so far are pretty good pairs for this. Transcendence, God is holy, God is distant. Eminence, God is personal. He thinks, speaks, acts, and he relates to us. And those two as a pair together give us the full expression of what we're talking about with God. When we're talking about holiness, though, what we are specifically zoning in on is the fact that in all of his attributes and in every nature, every aspect of his person, God is the only one like him. No one else really compares to God. And as you go then through each one of the attributes, you can recognize he is absolutely and utterly unique. Now, one of the ways in which he is unique is his ethical holiness. The difference being, however, that in his sal salvation plan, he makes it possible for us to grow in ethical holiness. We will become more and more like him in this respect. And let me show you the passages that I'm talking about, and then I'll explain the distinction a little bit more. So here, Psalm 24, verse 3, who shall ascend, ascend into the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Well, I mean, the initial answer is no one. But by the power of the cross, yes, I can. And in fact, the passage or other passages go on to build this idea, the person who was humble in heart. As he which hath called you is holy, God is holy. Now watch this. So be ye holy in every manner of conversation, in every aspect of your lifestyle, because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. And pause there for a second. And we just recognize, based on the discussion we already had, one definition or understanding of holiness is that God is unique. No one is like him. You cannot be like God, except the passage just said, be like him. What's going on? And the answer is, we've got a, a separate concept for holiness here. Whereas the concept we were talking about before, God is holy, he is unique, there is no one like him. The concept we're talking about now is the concept of ethical holiness, that you are free or you're, you're, you're removing yourself from sin. And on that point, yes, it's poss possible, quite possible, for a person to pursue holiness. It's a different or a distinct idea, related but distinct with this concept of holiness. Finally, 1 John 1 verse 5, this is the message we have heard from him and declare unto you that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. And as you proceed through the passage, you can see very much the concept of light and darkness. It's, it's ethics. It's talking about right and wrong. So these two concepts I, you need to know and remember. God is essentially holy or essential holiness in his essence, meaning he in his essence is unique. No one is like God. And ethical holiness, God is separate from sin or distinct from sin. The next attribute we're going to talk about is God's sovereignty. God is in complete control over all things. I'll just show you one passage here, one um, but significant and beautiful passage that's going to illustrate this sense of sovereignty. And you can go across scripture and find many, many, many other passages that support this. Daniel 4.35, all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. So in heaven and in earth, that's everything. In heaven and in earth, he does what he wants. No one can stop him. No one can reach out and stop his hand or say to him, what are you doing? Challenge his ability to do things. Why? Because God is completely sovereign. God is in charge of all things. Does this extend even to sinful things? See, one of the problems you get into with this discussion is if God is sovereign over all things, if he is in control over all things, well, sin happens. So does that mean that God is the foundation or the basis or the reason for that sin. And we know from scripture, God is never the cause of sin. So what's happening there? Or how do we understand those passages? And here there is a, a helpful distinction that we can observe 
that God is not the cause of sin, but even in the case of sin, he is still in control. And a couple of passages that I'll show you with that. Here, the first, just a beautiful, encouraging passage. This is Joseph speaking to his brothers. As for you, you intended evil against me. That was your goal. You intended evil against me. God intended good for me. Good for me and good for many people, as it is this day to save many people alive. What you're getting in this is there are times when the people go set out and they work sinful things. And, and, and biblically speaking, the cause or the basis for what happened in that sinful action, it goes back to the person. The person is the reason. God is not the cause of that evil. So what is then the basis of understanding God's sovereignty? And the answer is God can turn wicked things into beautiful things. At the same time, a person can intend evil, and they can do it. And in the very same action, God can bring that thing about to good for his honor and for the good of people. The same thing with the next passage, Acts 2.23. This is the, the crucifixion of Christ. Jesus Christ being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken, and by wicked hands you have crucified and slain. This latter part, the betrayal of Jesus, the crucifixion and killing of Jesus, even probably by implication, wicked hands, even the, the beating, the torture, and so forth, all of this. Clearly, everything I have highlighted is deeply sinful. Yeah, there's a decent case to be made that this is one of the most profound expressions of sin in the history of humanity. God sent us a savior. We killed him. So here is wickedness, human wickedness. I just want you to notice, he, Jesus, was delivered over by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. And the point that's being made here, Acts 2, in Peter's sermon, the point being made is that none of this happened by accident. You did wickedness, and you thought, okay, now we have killed the Messiah. And Peter says, oh, and so to interpret that with a theological grid, God was always in charge. Now, if you notice carefully, Jesus was delivered over by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. I think the concept here goes, it is not that God caused the crucifixion, but it is that he allowed it, and that having allowed it, he turned this towards the good of humanity. And yes, it was determinate, and it was foreknown, it was determined, it was going to happen. And yet the distinction that we would make with just to understand, understanding this theologically is that God is not the cause of sin. Certainly he allows sin. And having allowed it then, everything that happens is completely in his control. He is in control of all things. Now, this gets complicated. And we'll return to this question in the, our discussion of salvation. We actually have an entire chapter on this question of God's sovereignty and human free will. I would just like to put in here right now uh, a little bit of this thought, and I want you to ponder it, and then we'll return to it in a future semester. But even the language of human free will raises some questions for me. How much do you want to talk about human, humanity having freedom from the control of God, I'm a little uncomfortable with that. And core or critically, I want to say this, you never want to have a part of the universe, any part of the universe, anywhere, that is somehow free or outside of the control of Almighty God. Okay, a core question we're asking with this is, who's running this universe? And if the answer to your question is anything besides God, this is a very scary place to be. If any part of your answer is, well, God is in control of most things except for human free will, and when human free will steps in, then no, God can't go there. God's not allowed to interact there. Number one, you're missing scripture. All over scripture, you see God, and by his determinate counsel and foreknowledge, he is in control of things that are even human actions. But together with that, we can just recognize that if God, or if anything besides God is in control of this universe, this is a very scary place to live. Yes, God is in control of all things. 
How is it possible then for human beings to still make choices? That's a question we'll wait on. And I do, of course, believe in authentic, meaningful human choice. Just so much as we recognize together with this, ultimately and fundamentally, God is in control of all things. Our next attribute to talk about is omnipotence. And of course, related to what we've just talked about, omnipotence would tell us that God is capable of anything he desires to do. Related to sovereignty, if God is in control of all things in the universe, God is also all-powerful, or he is almighty, he can do anything that he desires to do in that universe. And let's start out by recognizing a number of passages that teach this. Job 42.2, I know that thou canst do everything and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Um, I put over here another translation that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. No one can stop God's purposes or what he intends to accomplish. All that God intends to do, he can and will do. Genesis 18.14, is anything too hard for the Lord? And now this is actually the angel of the Lord speaking, but the prophecy comes that Sarah will have a son. Psalm 89 verse 8, O Lord God of hosts, who is a strong Lord like you? That sounds like holiness, doesn't it? There is no one like God. To your faithfulness round about you. And here I just want you to notice, I'll continue with this idea in a bit, but just notice here the concepts of creation, the sea, the waves. This probably refers to a creature of some sort, because here as one that is slain, God's enemies, the heavens, the earth, the world, the fullness thereof, the north, the south, even the nations. It's strong. Thou hast a mighty arm, strong is thy hand, and high is thy right hand. Okay, so at the beginning of the, and the end of the passage we're reading, the selection we're reading, verse 13 and verse 9, who is a strong Lord like you? And in the middle, all of these aspects of creation that he is absolutely in control over. Isaiah 40, 28, have you not known, have you not heard, that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he does not grow weary, he doesn't faint. There's no searching of his understanding. And Romans 1.20, the invisible things from him are see, clearly seen through the creation of the world, being understood by things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. The basic argument going, even people who reject the existence of God or who, who reject his authority, know in their hearts, they do know that God is there and that he is great. Now, one comment I'd like to make here, just notice the strong link between sovereignty and, cre or excuse me, omnipotence and creation. So part of that is right here, the creation of the world. Just a moment before, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth. And of course, I highlighted that in Psalm 89 with all of these expressions about his creation. One of the patterns with the sovereignty and the omnipotence, the power of God, God is powerful and he can do anything he desires to do. One of the emphases with that is in relation to creation. Why? Because as a human, I can't think any bigger than that. And so part of the concept goes, okay, fine, humans, here is the biggest thing you can imagine. Everything besides God, everything else. And the answer is, yeah, God made all of that with a word. Part of the richness of the creation narrative, when God says, let there be light, let there be the firmament, let there be animals, is he creates with the power of his word. That's a big idea across scripture. When God creates, he creates with his word words. And I think that's a beautiful idea because it tells us something about his authority. You can tell someone has a lot of authority when they tell people to do things and stuff starts happening, right? Okay, I want it to be this way, make sure it's on time and everything in place, go. And people start running. Wow, that guy has some authority. Here's the authority of our God. When God wants there to be an earth, a sun, stars, billions of galaxies. When God wants that to happen, he says, let there be, and there is, it comes to existence. The world itself runs around to do his bidding. One question I'd like to just raise here for a quick second. This comes up sometimes in a, 
a silly form. And the question goes, if God is all powerful, if he can do anything, can he create a rock that's too big for him to lift? Or in a less silly form, a, a better way of asking would be something like, if God can do anything, can he sin? Can he choose to sin? And the actual underlying question here goes, not just can he do anything? That's a misdefinition of sovereignty and of, excuse me, of omnipotence. But the core question you ought to be asking instead, or the definition of omnipotence, not that he can do anything, but that he can do anything he wants to do. Okay, let me show you first a few passages that talk about the idea that God, in, in some form, it is impossible that he cannot do certain things. So here are passages that do this. If we believe not, he abides faithful. He cannot deny himself. Here, it is impossible for God to lie. Here again, Titus 1, 2, in the hope of eternal life, that God, who cannot lie, promised. And finally, James 1, 13, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. Okay, you have in those four passages some language of cannot, impossible, it will not happen, that kind of concept. And I would read these passages uh, not at all in the sense that God is there and there are certain things, you know, he would start to do something and he would kind of run up against a glass wall. Oh, I can't do this one. That's not the idea. The idea, the true idea of power is that you're able to do things you want to do. In other words, there's no particular power in doing awful things. That's not a power, that's weakness, that's horror. True power is power under control, right? I, I, you know, if, if you had a wild animal that just runs about tearing and destroying anything about it, that's not power. True power is, is a, a being, a creature that has the ability and controls that ability and can do things with it. That's power. And the core of this concept is God is all powerful, meaning he can do anything he wants to do not just that he goes about as an unleashed power and destroys things. So the actual question underneath this, can God sin or can God create a rock too big to, for himself to lift? There is actually no question there. The real issue is that we ought to define omnipotence better. <laughs> and if we define it correctly, then the, the problem disappears. I'll move now to omniscience. And what I've defined here for omniscience is that God knows all things, both actual and possible. Now, what do we mean by that? Let me build out the idea first, and then I'll show you some examples of actual and possible things and the reality that God knows both. First, a group of passages that talk about God's infinite knowledge. Now, notice my downsetting, my uprising. You understand my thoughts afar off. A little bit later in the same psalm, even before there is a word in my mouth, God knows it all together. You know, even as a thought is forming and you haven't yet figured out how to say it, God could already tell you what that thought is. Psalm 94, verse 11, the Lord knows the thoughts of man, and he knows that they're vanity. Isaiah 46, the Lord declares the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand. If up here what we're talking about is that God has the ability to, to understand what's inside my head, and again, what's inside my head, that's a space that I can't cross, right? I can't look inside someone else's head and know their ideas or their thoughts. I'm limited to what's in my mind or what I can perceive in the world around me. God crosses over that. If that's the case there, the concept down here would be God's knowledge crosses over time. And so even from the distant past, he can know events that have not yet happened because his knowledge or his thoughts are not limited by time. And Psalm 147, verse 5, great is our Lord and of great power. His understanding is infinite. Really a beautiful expression of this concept. Infinite understanding, understanding of all things. So if I put these pieces together, I think it's easily supportable, and we can recognize from across Scripture that God knows all things. Here's where this gets somewhat more interesting. God not only knows all things as we're seeing it here, these kinds of concepts. But God also knows things that we would call hypothetical. Let me show you what those look like. Matthew eleven twenty one. 21. Woe to you, Chorus, and woe unto thee, Bethsaida, if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon. Well, I mean, they weren't. But if, 
they would have repented. God can tell you what would have happened under different circumstances. 1 Samuel 23, 11, David asks the Lord, will the men of Caleb deliver me up into Saul's hand? Will Saul come down? Then said, uh, and the Lord said to him, he will come down. Then said David, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? The Lord said, they will deliver you up. And so David and his men rose and departed out of Keilah and they went and David escaped. Now, if you're following the flow of the passage here, what's going on is David is asking, if I stay here, will we be taken? Will this city hand us over? God's answer is yes. So David gets up, he leaves, the people never hand him over. Meaning God knew what would have happened had David acted differently. And I, that's not really a, a thing to occupy your attention that much. I mean, it's there. It's not a huge emphasis in scripture. All of it is just to say God's knowledge extends as far as you can think of knowledge extending. He knows even and can say what would have happened under different circumstances or in a different scenario from what actually was going on. Another concept that's related to God's perfect and infinite knowledge is that God is all wise. And sometimes this is called omnisapience, which is a very similar idea, but it is the expression instead of all knowledge, all wisdom. So we have passages like this, Isaiah 40, 13, who has directed the spirit of the Lord or being his counselor hath taught him. God needs to be taught by no one. O Lord, how manifold are thy works, and wisdom have you made them all. And in his wisdom, we see that in the creation around us. Psalm, Romans eleven thirty three. 33. O the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Just to it, it distinguish these out a little bit, to have all knowledge would mean that you have the information. To have all wisdom would mean that you know how best to act upon that information. Or another way to say it is that God sees exactly his purposes and he proceeds towards those purposes perfectly and wisely. He is in control of this world. He knows all things and he knows exactly the best way to accomplish his intentions. And I think this is an important bedrock as you and I live in a broken world, as we struggle in a broken world, there are things about us that get really hard. There are trials, difficulties, there are moments even when we look around us and we wonder about the goodness of God because things are painful. And the basic foundation underneath here is trust and believe that God is all wise. He knows what he's doing, even if you and I cannot understand his purposes in it. The next definition or the next attribute, God is omnipresent, meaning he is everywhere at once in the totality of his being. Okay, let me show you some passages and then let me explain what I mean by the language and the definition I just gave you. So these passages describe his omnipresence. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? The heaven and heaven of heavens, which is just a way, a way of expressing, just if you think of the sky, and imagine as if you could just multiply that out a few times. That, and in, in the furthest extreme, cannot contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Jeremiah 23, 23, am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? The idea of this would be kind of like, you remember Jonah fleeing from God? Well, maybe if I go to this distant place, and God's saying, you know, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a local deity. I'm not a God in certain areas, and you go to a different area and I'm not there. Anywhere you go, I'm there. Can anyone hide himself in secret places and I won't see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth? Saith the Lord, God is everywhere. Psalm 139 verse seven and out through verse 12. Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Whither shall I free from, flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I tw take, my, take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there. Do you see that there, there, there concept? Even there shall thy hand light lead me and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the light shall be light about me. This is interesting because it kind of combines omnipresence and omniscience, doesn't it? Darkness and light. Even if I go to the furthest extreme and I hide myself, you see me. 
The darkness hides not from you. The night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee. God is everywhere. There is nowhere you can go to flee from his presence. That also means, as kind of a connected idea, that God is present everywhere at once in the totality of his being. This is a, a bit more philosophical, but it's an idea worth understanding. Part of the distinction is that I can be present in one part of me. If you want to, we'll just do this as an imagination. If I, I just stretch myself out, one part of me is here, one part of me is there. Right? And so as a result, then, you know, I'm kind of stretching myself and therefore I, I can cover a certain very limited amount of space. It is not as though God spreads out his being so that his, the one end of him extends to this side of the universe and the other end of him extends to this side of the universe. And so this part of him is here while this part of him is here. That's the wrong way to think about this. The better way or the right way to think about this is that God is everywhere. All of God is everywhere. Every aspect of his being is everywhere at once all the time. It is not as though God sees a need or a concern here and he travels there quickly or instantaneously. And so now he's here. No, now he's there. Now he's there. Now he's there. It's not as though he moves about. He just is everywhere all the time. Now, one concept I'd, li I'd like to explain here and it actually was in one of the passages we just read a bit ago. The question goes, what about places where God kind of reveals himself in a localized or geographic way? The passage I'm talking about is here, 1 Kings 8. Will God indeed dwell on the earth? The heaven and heavens of heavens cannot contain him. How much less this house that I have built? Well, in 1 Kings 8, Solomon is talking about the temple. And you could move out from the temple, you could talk about the tabernacle, you could talk about before that the burning bush, you could talk about Sinai. These ways in which God has revealed himself in a localized way, that you see God's presence entering the temple. And as a result, no one can even go up into the temple because of God's glory as it's evidenced in that place. Or you have other passages that work like this. Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Well, one could say something like, oh, well, yeah, that doesn't mean anything because he's everywhere already. So in what sense does he dwell with us? Another form of this is we talk about the Holy Spirit indwelling believers. And so where is he's dwelling in me? Well, does that mean then if a person's an unbeliever, he doesn't dwell there? I thought God was everywhere. So here's the concept, and we will return to this concept in the future. And the concept of God's omnipresence is not that he's absent in certain places because he dwells in certain places. Okay, he's present in the temple. That means he's not present in Philistia or Samaria. It's not the idea. The idea that is that God is present everywhere. We don't always see his glory present everywhere. God is right here, right here, right now. God is right there with you right now in whatever you're doing right now. God is present with us everywhere. The reality, though, is if God showed his glory to me right now in this place, I'm done. I mean, I, I can't sustain, I can't continue, I can't exist if God showed his full glory in any place. And so the, the fuller concept goes that God is present everywhere, but he manifests himself. He opens or he pulls back the curtain. He allows people to see some of the expression of his glory at certain times and in certain places. And that's not because he travels to those places. He exists everywhere. But at certain times and in certain places, he allows people to see the fullness and the glory of who he is. And that, I think, helps us understand or appreciate what's going on in these passages. What's happening in the temple? God is revealing his glory there. Well, he is present in Samaria and Philistia, but he is showing his glory in a special way in that place. And the same thing when we talk about the Spirit indwelling us. God is showing his glory in our hearts and in our lives. He's working in a powerful way, even though he is present everywhere. The next definition is self-sufficiency. And the definition I've used here is that God exists necessarily of himself, and there is nothing that God depends on for his existence or his well-being. Now, this is a little bit more philosophical, 
but it's a concept still that is worth, I think, appreciating and recognizing. And I'll show you a few passages that support this idea. Let's talk about these. Exodus 3.14, God said to Moses, I am that I am. Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. This is, of course, the foundation for what we find across the Bible and, and the Old Testament in the name Yahweh or Jehovah. So this Jehovah language is actually the Hebrew verb, I am. And I am, I am, I am, I am, all the way across the Bible is giving you this kind of sense. There's a lot of discussion about what I am means, why the word is used that way. And the answer is probably a lot of things. <laughs> there are probably multiple ideas that are emphasized in it. But one of the main ones is that God exists. He exists eternally and independently. He needs nothing else to support him. Acts 17, 24, God that made the world and all things therein, seeing he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelt not in temples made with hands. Neither is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needed anything. He's the one that give us, gives to all life and breath and all things. In Isaiah 43, here, you are my witnesses that you may know and believe me, understand that I am he. That's kind of the I am or the Lord, the Jehovah language. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. Psalm 92. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. You, God, exists, existed from eternity past. And the concept then that I think is, is worth our recognizing probably as a, a separate attribute or a characteristic, what is God like, is that we don't want to think of kind of the universe or reality or even things like truth or goodness or logic existing before God. As though if you want to imagine these kind of like a black box of space, those things are there and then one day God comes into existence and he fills that box. That's a wrong way to think of God. You don't want to think of something like any of those I just men mentioned, truth or logic or even time or space or reality, as though then God fills those things, as though somehow God enters into those realities and then those realities kind of define him, as though God is underneath time, God is underneath logic. God is underneath space or reality or some other limitation. Actually, the, this gets a little philosophical and a little complicated. God works within time. And yes, God absolutely is a truthful, logical, faithful God. But the concept that that goes, those things did not exist before God. Those things exist as an expression of who he is. There is truth because there is God. There is reality because God exists. God is the most fundamental and the most basic. And that means he exists of himself. There is nothing God depends upon for his existence or his well-being. There are no rules that he must follow. He is not under um, a set of rules or guidelines. He is faithful, truthful, consistent with himself because that is his nature. And he is always that way because of who he is, not because he is under some other authority. Uh, an additional and the last two attributes we'll talk about, God is immutable. Okay, again, this moves a bit more philosophical. When we talk about immutable, we're talking about the fact that God does not change. Here's language, however, that I really want to make sure you understand and appreciate because it, it does make a significant difference for our understanding of this concept. God is unchanging, meaning God is unchanging in his person, character, purposes, and promises. God is unchanging in his person, character, purposes, and promises. The reason that matters, this can get philosophical in a bad way. 
when it moves off into the direction to say, well, if God is unchanging, how can he interact with the world? How can he hear my prayers? How can he respond? He can't do anything if he is unchanging. And that's a wrong understanding of this idea. God never changes in his per person, first of all, out of these four. And what that means is that the God of the Old Testament and the New Testaments, he is one God. Okay, language like this, Psalm 102, verses 25 to 27, the heavens will perish, but God will remain. They will all wear out like a garment. God will change them like a robe. They will pass away. I hear these words though, but you are the same and your years have no end. It, 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 we might talk about, well, you know, decades go by, generations go by, and here's a very old person, and all through those decades of years, they have more or less stayed the same. Wow, what a person. What about a God who speaks of the heavens and the earth going by, and he is still the same? Epochs, universes later, here is God. Now, when I say God's person never changes, I think one of the ways I see this expressed, sometimes people hear or they talk about the Old Testament God and the New Testament God, as though the Old Testament God is a little more harsh, the New Testament God is more gracious. And that would be absolutely and fundamentally counter-biblical. God does not change in his person. There is one God from Genesis 1 all the way to the end of Revelation. God is one he does not change. God never changes in his person. God never changes in his character. And what we mean by that then is that in his nature or what he is like, precisely what we've been talking about, his attributes. In terms of his attributes, his attributes do not change. He is one God. And here, Malachi 3.6, uh, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. Uh, the idea of this goes, if it were possible for God to change in his nature, he would be so frustrated with the sin of humanity who would destroy them. The only hope of humanity is that God made promises that he would redeem us. And his promises cannot be set aside. I change not. That's the only reason that you are still alive. The promises and the reality of God unchanging. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. It comes down from the Father of lights. This is similar logic. The same goodness of God is on this foundation, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. If God changed, we're in trouble. But he is the same good and gracious God who gives perfect gifts, always has and always will, because God never changes in his character. God never changes in his purposes. Isaiah 46, 9, remember the former things. I am God, there is none else. There is none like me. I declare the end from the beginning. My counsel shall stand. I will do all my pleasure. I will also bring it to pass. I have purposed it, I will do it. Or similarly, Psalm 33, 11, the counsel of the Lord stands forever. The thoughts of his heart to all generations. God's purposes for humanity, for the world, for salvation, do not change. And related to that, finally, God's promises never change. The strength of Israel will not lie or repent. He is not a man that he should repent. God is not a man that he would lie, neither the son of man that he would repent. Have he said, and shall he not do it? Has he spoken, shall he not make it good? When God says he will do something, he absolutely does it. He accomplishes all of his will. I'll pause for just a second on this latter point. There are a few passages, and we will return to some of this later on, that talk about God repenting, or a better word to say, um, God changing his response to a situation. And so, for instance, the, a key illustration of this would be Nineveh. God said, in 40 days, Nineveh will, Nineveh will be destroyed. Jonah walks about preaching this. The people repent. And so because they repented, God has compassion on them, and he's no longer going to destroy the city. So it sounds like God did change. He said, didn't he? In 40 days, Nineveh will be destroyed. Did he change his purposes or his plan? And the answer is, in these kinds of cases, God is not the one who changed. It was the people who changed, right? I mean, this should be clear enough, that when Jonah warned them, this thing will happen. There is in that, even though Jonah never said it, a kind of a warning. Why would God send warning about it and not just do it? And the response of the king of Nineveh, well, perhaps God will 
will show mercy and not destroy us if we will repent. The people changed. They repented. And in response to a changing situation, God also responded. So the way to read these passages, when you read about God changing his mind or God having compassion, it's not that God is fickle. It's not that God thought, well, I'll do this. Oh, no. On second thought, mm, ah, I'll change my mind. I'll do this. That wouldn't work. That wouldn't fit biblically at all. The concept instead, rather, is the situation itself has changed. God is responding to people who have responded or repented. And that should be obvious even in the key passage I just talked about. One of the passages I quoted, 1 Samuel 15, 29, God is not a man that he would lie or repent. Well, if you look in the context of that passage, that's one of the ones we struggle. It repented the Lord that he made Saul. And it says that twice, but right in the middle here is this declaration, God does not change his purposes. And the core concept of this goes, God's fundamental purposes do not change. People change, and God responds when they do. But fundamentally, his purposes are always the same. The last attribute is spirit. God cannot be seen. He has sometimes chosen to represent himself physically but God is a spirit. Now, different passages support this. John 4, 24, just very simple and explicit. God is spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Other passages talk about the fact that God cannot be seen, and because he cannot be seen, or he cannot be seen because he is spirit. In other passages, we read that no one has ever seen God, John 1.18. We read that he is the invisible God, Colossians 1.15, the God who no one can see, 1 Timothy 1.17. So here's a reality stretching across all of Scripture. God is spirit. What does that mean? What is a spirit? And one or two concepts I'd like you to recognize, just because we're talking about spirit, does not mean that someone or something is kind of amorphous, uh, kind of like a cloud, a zombie, a ghost kind of thing, um, something that cannot have any form to it. You see across scripture records of different people that saw angels, and they're able to describe the angel. Daniel is able to recognize an angel. Oh, this is Gabriel who came to me before. And Isaiah and John can describe specifics of the angels, kind of their appearance, and say it was like this, it was like this, it was like this. Angels are spirits. And again, we will come back to the concept of what is a spirit in the future. But when we talk about God as spirit, I'd like to just qualify here. That does not necessarily mean that he exists in a non or an unclear way god is still personal as a spirit he is still a being and a spirit is as real as a physical thing there's nothing less real about spirits they're every bit as real as anything else what does it mean then when scripture talks about god using descriptions right we see in scripture god sits upon a throne or even god walking or god, the face of god or god bearing his arm i mean th these kinds of concepts that sound like there's almost a physical form behind what we're talking about and i, I would like to say two things here first of all these are definitely figures of speech these are ways of describing God, comparing him to humans, the way that a human would do this, the way that a human would do that. And so to say that God does certain things in comparison, a human like, like this, is not to say that God is human. It is to say that there are characteristics or ways that God is expressing about his nature to us using the metaphor of humans. So that's common in literature. It's called anthropomorphizing, a way of describing something as a figure. At the same time, I would just in, in, include in here the idea that Scripture intentionally uses some of this language on purpose to remind us that God is absolutely personal. A spirit is capable of talking, thinking, acting, intervening in the world. None of that is impossible for a spirit. And part of the language that is used in scripture this way is to show us that, that God is interacting in the world in a real way, not just a hypothetical way, to show us the reality of his person, that he is a personal God.
take all of the attributes together. And what we've talked about today is that God is personal, holy, sovereign, all-powerful, that he knows all things, that he's present everywhere, that he depends on nothing, that he's unchanging in his character, per person, purposes, and promises, and that he is spirit. And in all of these respects, I would just want to highlight what we have talked about earlier, that God is prior and more ultimate than anything in this world. He is above and extends beyond any limitation of power. He knows all things. He's everywhere. He depends on nothing. All of the ways that you and I think that a, a reality has to be, how can something exist in the world if it's not like this, are all expressions of our createdness. All I've ever known is what it's like to be a creature. And that takes me back to the fundamental idea I talked about at the very beginning. One of our emphases was the diagram or the way of recognizing God and everything else, the only realities that exist. We describe this further as God's transcendence, that he is distinct from all other things. We describe this further as the fact that he alone is creator, everything else is created. And if I'm now putting that in light of all of these other realities we've been talking about in the attributes of God, then we're seeing the richness of this now. He is not limited by power or by space or by information. He is not changeable like we are. Because before there was anything, he was. And our study of the attributes of God will continue next time with the attributes of his goodness his grace, his mercy, his love, his faithfulness, even his justice. But we ought to stop in response to the richness of the things we've considered here and be in awe. Everything that you think is necessary for normal reality, recognize that our great God transcends it all. Our God is a great, almighty, holy God. And understanding his nature calls us then to worship before him.